And now on for our dinosaur of the day, Brontosaurus, which again is my favorite dinosaur, and I completely credit the movie The Land Before Time for that one. Watched it every day for a year as a kid. It drove my dad nuts, I'm sure. You wore out your VHS tape. Sure did. <laughs> so, the name Brontosaurus means thunder lizard, and the type species is Brontosaurus excelsus, which Charles Marsh named in 1879. The species name Excelsus means noble or high. Well, that's quite an epic name, Brontosaurus Excelsus. Yeah. Brontosaurus lived about 155 to 152 million years ago, and fossils have been found in Wyoming and Utah. For a long time, it was considered a junior synonym of Apatosaurus, and the original species, Brontosaurus Excelsus, was reclassified as Apatosaurus Excelsus in 1903. So, how did this happen? Well... The Morrison Formation was the center of the Bone Wars, which we've talked a lot about the Bone Wars in past episodes. And during the Bone Wars, there were a lot of dinosaur descriptions that were rushed so that Charles and Cope could compete to see who could name the most dinosaurs. Marsh actually named Apatosaurus in a two-paragraph article for the American Journal of Science in 1877, and then wrote a more detailed article in 1879 with a sketch of an apatosaurus pelvis, shoulder blade, and vertebra. And again, Marsh named Brontosaurus in 1879. So in 1903, Elmer Riggs said that Brontosaurus was too similar to Apatosaurus, and he called Brontosaurus excelsus Apatosaurus excelsus. Apatosaurus was named first, so Brontosaurus became a synonym. However, <laughs> I like this fact, Henry Fairfield Osborne decided to label the skeleton in the American Museum of Natural History Brontosaurus, even though he opposed Marsh and Marsh's taxa. I'm not entirely sure why he would do that. Maybe he just liked the name better? Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. It is arguably a better name. Thunder Lizard versus Deceptive Lizard. But anyway, the American Museum of Natural History... Brontosaurus skeleton is the reason for so much controversy the last hundred years or so. So scientists thought it should be Apatosaurus, but the public knew it to be Brontosaurus. And because you had millions of people going through there every year seeing the label Brontosaurus on it. Yeah, and then it ends up in media and other things too. And we used to get into uh, conversations about that with people who weren't as big a dinosaur enthusiasts. Yeah, that's true. So the Brontosaurus skeleton was unveiled in 1905 at the American Museum of Natural History and was the first mounted sauropod, another reason it was so well known. It was a mostly complete specimen, but it was missing its feet, lower legs, shoulder bones, and tail bones. The tail was mounted with too few vertebrae, but it was according to what Marsh thought it should be. The skull was also based on, quote, the biggest, thickest, strongest skull bones, lower jaws, and tooth crowns from three different quarries, end quote, which most likely came from a Camarasaurus, which was the only other sauropod at the time with known skull material. Adam Herman, who worked on it, couldn't find any brontosaurus skull, so he had to hand sculpt a skull to stand in. And Osborne made a note in a publication that Herman's skull was, quote, largely conjectural and based on that of Morosaurus, which is now Camarasaurus. And we should note that's really not uncommon because finding a completely articulated skeleton is very rare. So you're almost always sculpting different bones and it's not uncommon to pick a skull from a sister taxa and just call it good enough because it's the best you can do. Yeah. And to date, there's still no brontosaurus skull that's been found. Hmm. But we know, I think we know a little bit more about how it looked and it would not have looked like the boxy Camarasaurus skull. Yeah, because we know it's closely related to Apatosaurus, so you can figure their head to be closer than Camarasaurus. More elongated and whatnot. Yeah. So, an Apatosaurus skull was found in 1909 near a skeleton that was found to be an Apatosaurus specimen. This skull was similar to Diplodocus' skull, and so many believed it was an Apatosaurus skull, though Osborne and others rejected this. William H. Holland, the Douglas and Carnegie Museum director, believed it was an Apatosaurus skull, but he didn't put a head on the mount at his museum, possibly because he was waiting for someone to find an articulated skull and neck. But then he died in 1934, and after he died, museum staff put a Camarasaurus skull on their mount. 
The first Apatosaurus with an articulated skull wasn't found until 2011. In 1931, the Yale Peabody Museum created a unique skull where they based the lower jaw on a Camarasaurus and gave it forward-pointing nasals instead of it being based solely on what Camarasaurus's skull looked like. In the 1970s, John Stanton McIntosh and David Berman re-described Diplodocus and Apatosaurus skulls and found that Holland was right and that Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus had a skull similar to Diplodocus. And so they reassigned many Diplodocus skulls as Apatosaurus. In 1979, Carnegie mounted the first Apatosaurus skull on a skeleton and then the American Museum of Natural History did the same in 1995 and relabeled their skeleton Apatosaurus excelsus and corrected the tail. It took until 1995 to correct that tail. Yeah. So in 2015, that's when Dr. Emmanuel Schopp and his team did a study that found that Brontosaurus was a valid genus and separate from Apatosaurus, though not all paleontologists agree yet. The study, again, was called a specimen-level phylogenetic analysis and taxonomic revision of Diplodocae dinosauria sauropoda. And in addition to Dr. Schopp, there was Octavio Mateus and Roger Benson, and the study was published in April of 2015. And this study found that two species that used to be considered Apatosaurus and Eobrontosaurus were now just Brontosaurus. So there's Brontosaurus parvus and Brontosaurus yanapin. And this is in addition to Brontosaurus excelsus being Brontosaurus excelsus again instead of Apatosaurus excelsus. Gotcha. So Brontosaurus parvus was first described as Elosaurus in 1902 by Gilmore and Peterson. Then it was assigned to Apatosaurus in 1994 and then to Brontosaurus in 2015. It includes a partial juvenile skeleton, a nearly complete skeleton that's mounted at Brigham Young University, and another partial skeleton. The oldest species of Brontosaurus is Brontosaurus yanapin, which was found in Wyoming in the Morrison Formation. It lived about 155 million years ago. It was 69 feet or 21 meters long and described in 1994 by James Fila and Patrick Redman, who named it a species of Apatosaurus. And the species name means breast necklace because it has pairs of sternal ribs that look like hair pipes worn by the Lakota tribe. Bob Bakker in 1998 said that it was more primitive than originally thought and named it Eobrontosaurus. The Greek word eos means dawn. And again, though, this is now back to being just Brontosaurus, according to the 2015 study. So the original intent of the 2015 study was to revise the family tree of, of diplodocids. Most diplodocid species were described in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and many holotype specimens were incomplete and fragmentary. So the study included 81 operational taxonomic units, 49 of which belong to Diplodocidae. The study is almost 300 pages long and had analyzed 477 different physical features of 81 specimens, and it, and it took visits to 20 museums in Europe and the U.S. In the study, as we talked about in our interview, they used algorithms to compare traits, and if more than 20% of the traits were different, they classified the bones as their own genus. And I have a lot of good quotes from Shop, and we he gave us a lot of good quotes in our interview, but these were just too good to also not quote. So <laughs> we have more quotes from him. Anyway, he said that, quote, the border between different species and different individuals within a species was progressively much lower. And we were surprised when we got these results that Brontosaurus was valid again. So they had Roger Benson from Oxford University verify their results. And Roger Benson said, quote, The differences we found between Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus were at least as numerous as the ones between other closely related genera and much more than what you normally find between species. Uh, in a lot of these articles, and there are so many because it was a huge deal when it came out, there's people are comparing Brontosaurus coming back as to Pluto and hoping that Pluto will be classified as a planet again. <laughs> it's kind of similar in that Pluto didn't actually go anywhere. It's just whether you consider it a dwarf planet or a planet. But at the same time, Brontosaurus excelsus was always still a <laughs> species. It just had a slightly different name. So yeah, it's not quite as 
that big of a change, but still a nomenclature thing. Yeah, that's true. So as Shop had said, this is a nice example of how science works and how this new finding can overturn more than 100 years of beliefs, which is crazy to think about. So Shop had said that this study couldn't have been done 15 years ago, but there's so many dinosaurs similar to Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus that have been found recently, so that made it a lot easier to re-examine. So, recapping, there are three valid species of Brontosaurus, according to the study. Brontosaurus excelsus, Brontosaurus parvus, and Brontosaurus yanapin. And the study found that Elosaurus and Eobrontosaurus are now synonymous with Brontosaurus. And that Brontosaurus amplis is an invalid proposed species and should just be combined with Brontosaurus excelsus. Marsh named Brontosaurus amplis back in 1881, but it's now considered to be a synonym of Apatosaurus excelsus, now Brontosaurus excelsus. Gilmore said this in 1936, McIntosh said it in 1990 and 1995, and Upchurch Tamita and Barrett said it in 2004, though most studies also said there needed to be more detailed assessment. Although it seems like a lot of people agreed on that. <laughs> anyway, so the 2015 study said that Brontosaurus had, quote, one, a longer than wide base of posterior dorsal neural spines, two, the area on the scapula posterior to the acromial ridge and the distal blade is excavated, Three, the acromial edge of the scapular blade bears a rounded expansion at, at its distal end. And four, the ratio of the proximodistal length slash transverse breadth of the astragalus is 0.55 or greater. Yep, I think he didn't want to bore us with all those details, which is why he kept <laughs> saying, like, there are differences. <laughs> but it is... It's interesting to see exactly what the differences are, and they're all very specific parts of bones. So, yeah. There are. There's there's more to it for Brontosaurus excelsis, but do we need, want to get into that much detail? I don't think we need to. That's a, but If there you're are, interested, we will be linking the study on our blog so you can go through the 300 pages. It, it is interesting. Yeah. Suffice it to say they found seven significant differences. Yeah, for Brontosaurus excelsus. But to kind of make it more in more general terms, Brontosaurus had a higher, less wide neck than Apatosaurus. And uh, Shop has this great quote in one of the articles that says, so although both are very massive and robust animals, Apatosaurus is even more extreme than Brontosaurus, which I think is interesting if you think about their names, Brontosaurus being thunder lizard and Apatosaurus meaning deceptive lizard. <laughs> But Apatosaurus is the more extreme, robust one. Yeah. I guess that could count. That's a bit deceptive. Yeah. <laughs> so Paul Barrett from the Natural History Museum in London said, quote, It's the biggest study on this family. They marshal a lot of evidence and make a very good case. And it's taken us a long time to convince people that we shouldn't be using the name Brontosaurus. Just as we've got to that point, it looks like we're going to have to turn around and say, actually, it's all right again, end quote. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty funny because we have had people say like, yeah, I know that Brontosaurus isn't a real dinosaur. And then... And we have to like, say, oh, actually well, it is now. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone's fully convinced of this yet, though. So Brian Switek said the problem is there's no standard for choosing which traits are significant. So there's still some subjectivity when classifying genera. And this might not be settled until a Brontosaurus skull is found. We talked about that a lot. Genera, it, classifying genera is very murky and, you know, hand waving. But the main thing is you just want to be consistent within a specific group of dinosaurs. So Yeah, which is what this study helped, as we talked about in our interview. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's weird how there wasn't consistency within even this group. Yeah. To plot a K. So Kenneth Carpenter from Utah State University's Eastern Prehistoric Museum said the fossil that Apatosaurus is based on hasn't been described in detail and should have been in order to be compared to Brontosaurus. He said, quote, so is Brontosaurus valid after all? Maybe, but I think the verdict is still out. 
And then we've got paleontologist Donald Prothero who said, quote, until someone has convincingly addressed the issue, I'm going to put Brontosaurus in quotes and not follow the latest media fad, nor will I overrule Riggs 1903 and put the name in my books as a valid genus. So there's not everyone is convinced and it seems like there will definitely be debate, although it doesn't seem to be quite as heated as Taurosaurus and Triceratops. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the reasons is when you have 113 years of history of calling something by a certain name, there's a little bit of an extra burden on justifying changing the name. And they might think, well, we haven't really gotten to that point yet. And for everybody, that's going to be a different threshold. So that's true. Just kind of takes a while to see where it settles out. I'm going to go ahead and believe. <laughs> <laughs> So, Brontosaurus was quadrupedal and had a long neck and a long whip-like tail and forelimbs that were a little shorter than its hind limbs. Originally, Brontosaurus and other sauropods were thought to be too heavy to walk on land, so it's thought that they lived partly in water, and we know now that's not true. If Brontosaurus were completely submerged in water, it would not have been able to breathe because the water pressure on its lungs would have been too much. Also, most sauropod fossils are found in what would have been dry inland areas. Like other sauropods, Brontosaurus had neck vertebra that was bifurcated, so it had paired spines, which meant it had a wide, deep neck. And its neck had air sacs to help make it lighter. And it also had tall spines on its vertebrae, like Apatosaurus. And it had long ribs compared to other diplodocids, so they had very deep chests. Brontosaurus had stout arm bones and a large claw on its forelimb and three toes on each foot. Each toe had a small claw as well. Why there's a claw on the forelimb is unclear. It may have been for defense, though it's not the best size or shape for that. It may have also been used for feeding or used to grasp things like tree trunks when rearing. That sounds pretty crazy. It does. <laughs> I would love to see that. Maybe as like a juvenile or something, it might make more sense than as an adult. I don't know. Why do spiders make webs? There are lots of good reasons to make webs. But if you're just looking at the fossils, how do you know? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Originally, Brontosaurus was thought to have a short tail, but Brontosaurus could crack its tail to signal to others or show dominance or warn predators such as Allosaurus, Torvosaurus, or Ceratosaurus. Brontosaurus excelsus is the largest species, and it weighed 15 tons and was 72 feet or 22 meters long. An adult Brontosaurus parvus is estimated to have weighed 14 tons. Sauropod trackways show that they moved as fast as 12 to 19 miles per hour, 20 to 30 kilometers per hour, and moved on average 12 to 25 miles or 20 to 40 kilometers per day. I wonder how they estimated that distance per day. That sounds a little That does odd. sound like a lot. But I mean, it sounds like that would be pretty hard to tell from a trackway. Yeah, that's true. Maybe a little more speculative there. <laughs> Hard to say. Uh, even though we don't have a brontosaurus skull yet, uh, scientists think it had a small head. Also, it swallowed stones to help it digest, and it may have reared up to reach high plants or fight for mates. Brontosaurus may have been a solitary kind of creature, but it's unclear. Brontosaurus has been featured in film, ads, stamps, and lots of other media, though. So there's Gertie the Dinosaur, which was Windsor McKay's animated film, one of the first, and Gertie is a brontosaurus. Also, Brontosaurus and Allosaurus battled in the 1925 silent film The Lost World, and Brontosaurus is also in the 1985 movie Baby Secret of the Lost Legend, and it's the logo of the Sinclair Oil Corporation, it's that green dinosaur. A full-size brontosaurus model of Sinclair's brontosaurus was at the 1964-65 New York's World's Fair as well. In 1989, the U.S. Postal Service made four dinosaur stamps, and one was brontosaurus, which people at the time complained as, quote, fostering scientific illiteracy, end quote. So the Postal Service said in Postal Bulletin 21744, quote, 
Although now recognized by the scientific community as a potosaurus, the name brontosaurus was used for the stamp because it is more familiar to the general population. They also said, quote, similarly, the term dinosaur has been used generically to describe all the animals, i.e. all four of the animals represented in the given stamp set, even though the pteranodon was a flying reptile rather than a true dinosaur, end quote, which people did not complain about. I would have definitely complained about that. That's outrageous. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. Like, we just call it that because people are always wrong about this. Is it a very good defense? Well, no, I think it's funny that people were upset about Brontosaurus, but not Pteranodon. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So Stephen Jay Gould, a paleontologist, wrote an essay and book partly based on this. The part bully for Brontosaurus says, quote, touche and write on, no one bitched about Pteranodon, and that's a real error, end <laughs> quote. Though he did agree that Brontosaurus was a synonym for Apatosaurus. And, of course, we've got Brontosaurus as Littlefoot in Land Before Time, which came out in 1988, the first one. The rest are not worth watching. But anyway, that's another topic. <laughs> so Brontosaurus is part of the family Diplodocidae, which includes Diplodocus, Supersaurus, Barosaurus. And it's also part of the subfamily Apatosaurinae, which includes Apatosaurus. The family... Name, Diplodocidae, means double beams, and the clad has 12 to 15 species that lived in the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous. Compared to Titanosaurs and Brachiosaurs, Diplodocids were slender and long with short legs, and their back legs were longer than their front legs. Many may have had spines on their back. They had very long necks. They may not have been able to lift their heads as high up as other sauropods, and they had small heads and peg-like teeth. They probably didn't chew, but instead swallowed gastrolis to digest their food, and they had long whip-like tails that they could snap. Diplodocidae was originally known as Amphisolidae, named by Edward Cope in 1878, but became a forgotten name. Charles Marsh also named the family Atlantosauridae back in 1877, but that also became a forgotten name, a nomum oblitum. Very interesting. <laughs> You can tell Sabrina was really into Brontosaurus by the length of that dinosaur of the day. It's great. 